Hi everyone, welcome to DDU Teaching for this week or Advanced Echo Teaching for this week. Um, it's a real pleasure to have back Ben Gahardi, who I think uh, most people have met before. I just want to give a little bit of an introduction I can because um, something quite special I feel has happened here at the PNICU in the last week or two in that Ben Gahardi is now on the uh, Echo reporting roster. So as those of you who don't know about Nepean ICU, it's a little unusual at Nepean Hospital. We have an echo lab here that is funded and staffed 50-50 by um, ICU. There's some ICU sonographers or ex-nurses uh, who work in there, as well as cardiac technicians. And the lab is funded 50-50 uh, between ICU and cardiology so that we have 50% of the reports as done by ICU and 50% done by cardiology. So it's a really unusual setup where we have intensivists reporting echoes along with cardiologists and I think what the strength of that is is that you get people with lots of different interests but a real passion for echocardiography together and that's unusual I've never seen it anywhere before and I'm really proud of this hospital for doing something that's a little unusual and uh, where in other states other countries uh, other units I've seen around the world you sometimes have a little bit of cardiology and ICU going head to head here very much you can see a, a blending of uh, passion and a blending of experience and uh, knowledge. It's not always perfect. I won't suggest that it's utopia or anything, but it's pretty good. Anyway, the exciting thing that happened last week is that we had a small position opening up for someone to get on the reporting roster for the uh, intensive care doctors. And uh, Ben Gahadi was uh, one of our, uh, was the lucky applicant who got the job. And Ben is a respiratory physician. And so I think, again, we feel like we've got another first where we've got a respiratory physician who's got, he's got the DDU, he's got the FASE, the Advanced Echo Cardiology um, uh, Echo Board exam from the ASC. So he's extremely well trained in echo. And we've got a respiratory physician who's now reporting echoes at Nepean Hospital as well. And and I think, again, that's just a, a really nice new blend of experience and uh, another line of uh, another line of analysis of the patients that we're going to see. So, again, congratulations on the position. It's a, a pleasure to have you on board. And <laughs> and we've given him the hardest talk in the entire thing <laughs> to start off the time talking about um, adult congenital heart disease for non-cardiologists. So thank you very, very uh, much. Thanks, Sam. And uh, with respect to being well trained, I mean, I did my training here. At the PN, so I'm fortunate to have ever been given the opportunity because there aren't any other units in the country that I know of that would have even given me a shot at this a few years ago. Um, with that said, I'm going to speak about adult congenital heart disease for the non cardiologist, so I'm probably appropriate given I'm not a cardiologist to speak about it. Uh, I'm taking an approach to this, as you'll see, that is a I guess a bit more probably a didactic session for this one as opposed to interactive because I think there's some fundamental things you need to know about adult congenital heart disease that uh, is a bit hard that you just have to know as your fundamentals as your basics and so as a result of that I do have some cases but I also have a bit more lecture heavy stuff than what some of the other DDU teaching sessions will have. Um, I'm trying to keep it moderately clinically orientated as best as possible but again there are some fundamentals you need to know before you can get to that next step. Um, as always ask questions along the way I do have a few questions to ask out to the audience um, and I've prepared about four hours worth of content and I've got about 40 minutes to do it in because <laughs> I'm going for a long run this afternoon so uh, whatever we don't get through we'll see what happens you might just have to click on that and okay so um, that is my disclaimer I'm not an expert I should also say that um, I have I find this stuff really interesting. Uh, my wife is a maternal fetal medicine physician and she does a fair amount of ultrasound as part of that. Uh, and so we do have some chats about fetal ultrasound and anomalies, which sort of feeds through to the next bit as well. So this stuff is really complicated. Uh, it comes down to diagnosed versus undiagnosed disease and the hemodynamic effects that we see in the intensive care unit um, from the drugs, from the invasive ventilation, from just being sick, uh, fairly complicated everything. Along the way, there's a few summary slides that I think just drive home the point of never assume that the lesions you're told about are the only lesions that are there and never assume that what you're seeing is all there is. Like, because you can miss a lot of flow. Um, there can be a lot of abnormal pressures within a repaired or unrepaired or partially repaired uh, congenital heart disease case. So quick quiz, what does congenital mean? Michael, because we're talking about congenital heart disease, like what does it actually mean? What does congenital mean? Uh, I mean, I feel like this is a trap. 
but I'm going to say it. <laughs> it's like a, it's a genetic disease that you inherit. I don't know. Is that? No. Abnormal growth, abnormal development. Not quite. So it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting because we throw the word congenital around for all these things. Like it can include genetic diseases, can include abnormal growth. So it's a condition that's present at birth. So from birth. So it can be a genetic thing. Trust me, 21. Congenital disease. Tetralogy of fallow, which is not necessarily related to genetics, is a congenital disease. So it's present from birth. So by cusp aortic valve, congenital heart disease. Um, like it took me quite a long time to learn what that meant as well. So <laughs> I'm glad I'm just not the only one. Um, so I'm going to run through a step rise approach first. So this is the fundamentals. So you talk about what is the cardiac position, what is its axis, what is the situs or sidedness, and it's knowing where the abdominal organs are to define that. And then I take a structured approach, with, which is what are the atria and where are they? What is the connection between the atria and the ventricles? What are the ventricles and where are they? What's the connection between the ventricles and the um, the outflow, so your uh, arterial? And then what is the arterial? Uh, and then you can work the backflow in around from that. I put the septum in last. There are different approaches to congenital heart disease, and this is the one that I sort of have come up with because it works best for my brain. Um, iatrogenic structures at the end, that's things like baffles, pacing lines, for example. So terminology, so our position is where the heart is. So the heart can be on the left, it can be on the right, it can be in the midline, and that can move. So a classic example is those with severe obstructive lung disease that can shuffle the heart around. You know, if you've got big lungs, can move to one side. You had a resection of a lobe, for example, your heart can move around in place of the space that's there. But the axis won't change. So your axis is where your apex is pointing. You have a left wood axis, a right wood axis. Uh, physician training, you know, we talk about the patient with dextrocardia, it's a classic short case, um, so that's a rightward axis. But you can have a dextrocardia, but the heart can be positioned to the left rather than on the right. People think dextrocardia means heart is on the right, it doesn't. Dextrocardia is where your axis is pointing, so it's axis to the right. Position can change, the axis will not. And we have to know a little bit about what is underlying the heart, right? So what is the situs? You've got to know where the lungs are and like whether they're flipped around or not, or you should know. And also the liver. And the liver is important because we think about livers and everything about IVCs. And the IVC is important because it gives you an anchor as to your anatomy. Because the IVC will drain into the morphological right atrium, which I'll get to in, in a minute. So situs solitus, which is the way uh, we are normally structured, where we have, if you look at the left, oh, sorry, look at the lung, you've got two lobes on the left and three on the right. That can be reversed, so your, everything is reversed, so abdominal organs are reversed, uh, and then you can have ambiguous, which is just a bit of everything. So our IVC drains into the right atrium, and that's an anchor point that I use in my brain. It's very rare that things are not that way. It's basically like it's an anatomical definition. So if you don't have a right atrium, which is rare, um, you can kind of get around that but you have a right atrium and a left atrium and you differentiate these so you can work out what anatomy happens next. Because if you know which one's your right atrium, then you can work out which one's your left. So the right atrium, the IVC will drain into it. It has a coronary sinus. It's got a broad appendage as opposed to our left atrial appendage, which is like that finger-like structure that we all see when we do a toe. And it'll have pectinate muscles in them. The left atrium, smoother walled, again, finger-like appendage. So you define what your right atrium is. And then it's the valve that determines what is the ventricle. Because you have your right atrium, what we think of as a right atrium, can be attached to a right ventricle or a left ventricle. But it's the valve that defines that. So if there's a tricuspid valve, then the ventricle that is attached to that valve is the morphological right ventricle. But a mitral valve, then the ventricle that's attached to that is your morphological left ventricle. Picking which is which, so the septal tricuspid valve leaflet will be more apically displaced uh, at the extreme. You know, that's what we talk about when we think about Epstein's, but they'll, it will be offset. So the tricuspid valve versus the mitral valve. Um, the right ventricle should have a moderated band. That's not always present, of course, not always visible at the very least, depending on how dilated and dysfunctional it is. And our left ventricle should just have two large pap muscles. We define our atrium, define the valve, and that lets us define the ventricle. So you can get atrioventricular discordance. We have our right atrium going to left ventricle and vice versa. And it's really important that we have an understanding of this because we throw around words like 
morphological and, and anatomical. But it can when we're talking across specialties or even talking across you know consultants, we can lose what's pumping where. And it's really important because when you've got a repaired congenital or an unrepaired congenital heart disease patient and they're 30 or 40 years old and it's their morphological right ventricle that's been supplying blood to their systemic circulation for the last 40 years, like it's, it's a ventricle that's going to burn out, right? Our, our morphological right ventricle is not designed for systemic flow, systemic circulation. So having our terminology and our anatomy right is, is really important. Um, after assessing the ventricles, I then assess what the outflow tracks are. So is there concordance where our right ventricle goes into our pulmonary artery, a left ventricle goes into aorta? Are they switched around? So you've got a right ventricle going into aorta and vice versa. You have a double outlet, as I've got in the picture here, where you've got two outlets coming off the one chamber. Now you have a single outlet, as we've got here, like a giant uh, atrioventricular septal defect, and all blood flows into one and off it goes, um, uh, and a common outlet. Uh, so taking it stepwise through, and then at the end, I look at what is the septum. Again, ASDs, as Emma spoke about last week, atrioventricular septal defects and VSDs. All the other bits at the end. So again, a quick summary slide. That's the stepwise approach to the anatomy uh, that I use when I'm looking at someone who's got congenital heart disease. And always look for more pathologies because it's a lot of these congenital diseases, congenital cardiac diseases, you know, they may have one condition, but one condition is often associated with many other conditions, and you won't always find them or you won't always know about them unless you go looking. Uh, and this is why it's important. Look, it's a cheesy slide, but it's important because what you see when you have someone in intensive care, you know, who's been alive for 20 or 30 or 40 years is you'd see the sequelae. Like we're not diagnosing tetralogy at this age. What we're diagnosing is the heart failure that's the result of it and working out what chamber pumps to where and then what medications and how we're going to ventilate them and whatnot. So you can get pump failure, you can get valve failure. Rhythm failure is a is a real issue because these atria are profoundly abnormal majority of these diseases. Uh, and then just structure failure, again, including things like baffle obstruction and whatnot. So I'm going to shuffle now to talk about some pathologies. Uh, I've got some case slides that are mixed in with this as well. So I'll speak about a few different pathologies with some imaging along the way. So ventricular septal defect, I'm not including ischemic ones here. We've spoken about that before, and that's a different kettle of fish. But a ventricular septal defect is reported as being one of the most common or the most common congenital heart defect, although different sources will say different things, but cuspid aortic valve, as we all know, is, is quite common. Um, as well as uh, um, other ASDs. So it can exist in isolation, but expect it to be part of something else until you know otherwise. Now, I really struggle with the anatomy for VSDs because there are so many different ways to describe the single same place of the heart with VSDs. So I use four words and I try and simplify everything back into the four anatomical terms we've got here, which is membranous, which is the most common, muscular, outflow and inlet. So membranous is also called, as you can see there, coniventricular, paramembranous, subaortic. You know, these are either synonyms or very close to synonyms. So I group them all as one. These are adjacent to your tricuspid valve, um, aortic valve, and it is about 80%. So it's the most common type that is of the congenital VSDs. Your muscular are virtually everything else. Your outflow, oh sorry, outlet, um, this is uh, only one to 5%. It's just beneath the semilunar valves. Uh, and then there's the inlet. These are rare and typically trust me 21 down syndrome. Uh, they're often associated with just having a, a single atrioventricular valve, a common atrioventricular valve. So AVSDs. So to conceptualize that from an imaging perspective, I use this picture. Um, there's another, my next slide is a graphic that it shows as well, but I quite like this one because it lets me conceptualize where exactly it is. You're taking that heart and you're splicing it down its long axis. And you can see, like, okay, my membranous, where is that sitting? You know, my outflow ones, oh, that makes sense. It's sitting right next to you know your your pulmonary trunk. Um, muscular is just down the wall, uh, and then your inflows where they are. And it's important to know where they are because that will affect closure if it's going to be done. So this is another way to represent it. This is nice to have by your side uh, if you're looking at echo pictures and you're going through trying to work out where exactly it is because you can correlate things a bit better with imagery. Um, same thing. So when thinking about a VSD, you think about where it is. You think about size, so small, moderate, large. Not every VSD will be closed, which means you can find VSDs in people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, 
you look for if it's involving other structures, what your atrial and, and left heart sizes are, if there's some pulmonary hypertension. Angle is really important here uh, because if you get some jet from your ventricular septal defect, some uh, systolic flow, that can contaminate what you're picking up and what you think is tricuspid regurgitation. So your numbers can be off uh, without being aware of it. Uh, and then other anomalies, as I've said. So you, this is not surprising. Your shunt's going to be left right. Um, what happens is as your shunt is larger, you get a volume overlay of your left ventricle. You can quantify a shunt fraction, which I think may have spoken about before. If not, I've got a slide on any at the end. Uh, and ultimately, if it's bad enough, you can get your isomengus physiology. We end up getting flow from right to left because your right pressures, your pulmonary pressures are larger than your systemic pressures. There's a phenomenon, and this is really why I kept this slide in, there's a phenomenon called a double chambered right ventricle, which is pretty like, insane, I think. So what happens is this high velocity jet that is coming from the left ventricle through that VSD into the right ventricle, the theory is it keeps hitting up against the endothelium and over time it causes damage and you end up getting this uh, second cavity forming as the RV sort of grows within itself. You get the second cavity form within the RV with an unchecked VSD. Uh, and they, what you see with those is it kind of like what you'd expect, right? You you would expect two layers of flow, so it comes up as mid-cavitary obstruction. It's like you've got a, a mid-cavitary obstruction in the LV, you can see it in the RV, uh, and it will look like it's a double-chambered RV. I've got a picture of it. Um, and yeah, childhood repairs can be incomplete. So a quick slide for shunt fraction. This is not a lecture about physics, but your um, RVOT, BTI, um, by your cross-sectional area of the RVOT, and then your LVOT, BTI, um, times your cross-sectional area. So you can work out what your ratio is here, your QP, QS, as it's called. Uh, so now I'm hoping these will play. They should loop. So, uh, hey, one, do you want to go through these cases first? Just to show what you see, there's nothing tricky about it. I mean, I've labelled it, but I thought I wanted to have it labelled for the sake of just being open and being able to talk about what this actually is. Yeah. Um, so it's a mid esophageal four chamber view. Um, on 2D, um, RV appears um, hypertrophied with a like, thickened wall. Um, and on color, um, the, uh, there's a there's a defect in the um, I think that's a membranous portion of the uh, septum um, with um, left to right shunt. Uh, actually, I, I can't really tell. There's a shunt um, in the color, but I, I can't really tell the yeah, direction no, with confidence. Fair, yeah, and I can see I you know, what I think I can see on this at least is I can see some. So unusual flow capturing right up there in that top of the corner there in the left ventricle. But, you know, we're heading up into our aorta there and our left ventricular outflow tract. Am I catching something at a funny angle? Don't know. Mm. Um, comment on ventricular function? Uh, they um, appear norm uh, normal. Normal. What about what walls are the ventricle of these? Uh, so four chambers. So... Um, uh, anterolateral and infraceptum. Right. Nice. Uh, scallops of the mitral valve? Uh, over to Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Good call, because he's got the DDU you know, later on. What scallops are we looking at? Uh, it kind of depends where we're cutting through. As we're getting closer to that aortic valve, it might be um, A2, P2, or mm. alternatively, sometimes you're getting a little bit of like A1. Sometimes I'm just going to throw out all the scallop names and then I'm just going to mute myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Nice, well played. Uh, so, anything here? Happy with that? Hey, Juan, still? What do yeah. you think? Does that look normal or abnormal to you? Um, it looks abnormal. Yep. Um, like, just um, on the ventricular portion, uh, like, aspect of the aortic valve, um, there seems to be like like a like a defect. Um, yeah, like yeah, they're keeping with in keeping with what we saw just then on the four chamber view. Okay, this one. It's a great case. Nice. Uh, all right. What do you see Ooh. here? Okay. Oh, good uh, sound. 
Um, there is, um, firstly, there's lots of um, like yeah, nice. turbulence. Um, uh, as to the, the cause of that, um, I mean, it could be due to like a coexistent aortic valve pathology. It could be due to that yeah, nice. uh, ventricular septal defect that I identified. Um, but that's about all I can comment on with confidence, really. Yeah, very nice. You know, these pathologies often don't travel as single agents. It's a 20 year old who's not had surgery. I'll, I'll let you know that much. Sure. Um, so we're not looking at a repaired disaster. We're looking at something that's unrepaired. Um, and what do you think about the color of all the, you know, the flow, velocities, turbulence? Yeah, I mean, it's it's aliasing, so like high velocity. Everywhere, right? Flow, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it might be hard because you can't slow it down, but do you think the the flow across the VSD is left to right or right to left? Um, left to right. Yeah. I mean, the RV itself is not big enough to generate flows the other way, right? Not the moment. Um, big aortic root. Yeah. yeah. What do you think of that aortic valve? Yeah, there is um, uh, aortic regurgitation there. Um, Mild, moderate, severe. I'd call that moderate. Um, I can see like a flow convergence. Um, um, yeah. I mean, I'd, off this alone, I'd probably tend towards more towards mild myself. But again, you need mm. some of the other values, right? And it's a congenital case, so things never the same. All right, so the same patient, scan state on the same day. Oh, okay. Stop looping, sorry. I don't know if I can make that loop, I'll just keep playing it. Yeah. Um, what do you see? Oh. Do you see anything in the right ventricle? Yeah. Right? What do you yeah. see? I mean, is that the is that what you mean by um double um uh I forget the word, but is that from the uh, VSD at high velocity into the RV wall and no, it's it's not a double chamber. Oh, okay. Um, but good thought. Yeah, uh, that could be. Um, I mean, uh, there's an echogenic like mass within yeah, the yeah, ventricle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it could be like from like trabeculation from, mm -hmm. um, like chronic hypertrophy. Like it's not going to be iatrogenic because he's hadn't had hasn't had an operation. Yep. Um, Mine, do you want to add anything? It's hard to see it. My screen is very small, but um, I don't know if it's, is it like a, is it a, I mean, it could be a thrombus, it could be on any other mass, but is it some sort of, maybe it's some sort of valve structure. I'm not really sure. Um, it seems to maybe be moving with the valve, oh, it's, but it's, it's hard it. to see. What about this? What's that? That line. Is that is that Epstein's anomaly? No. Mm -hmm. Oops. Now I'll go to the next one anyway. I think the next one might show be better. Uh it's not. So you know, as part of the valve, it's a prolapsing aortic valve coronary cusp that's partially occluding the VSD. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I'll go back. So I'll go back to here. So what you're seeing is this is a coronary cusp and it's intermittently occluding your VSD as it prolapses back in. So the aneurysmal, aneurysm of the aortic root that's coming down and, and causing it to sometimes have flow, sometimes not have flow with the VSD. You can clearly see that left to right shunt on that previous image on the right yeah, side. Yeah, there. massive, right? Can we loop it? Can we just stop it and loop them? Yeah, how do I just uh, yes. right. I have some of them set for loop. I thought I got all of them. I must have missed. Apologies for this. You want that and uh, play play back. There we go. Stopped. Awesome, I think. And that one as well, perhaps. Yeah. Stop. And then the next one is the key. Try that.
and go on one. Yeah. Wow. So here's our. You see that 2D defect just right here and in here. Yeah. Jeez. And so you see how there's color coming through here. Like on other views on the toe, so same patient, same same day. On the toe, you could easily see where that uh, left or right shunt was. You, know, you, you picked it obviously. But when you looking at this from a transthoracic, if all you had was a transthoracic, you see abnormalities, but you wouldn't see the shunt as easily this way. Wow. But that's what's happening in this patient. He's got a prolapse that's partially occluding at times his, his VSD. Is this from our lab? Yes. Wow. Uh, and this is what it was in short axis. You can appreciate it prolapsing out a little bit there, but not as much. Um, I'll go through. So this is a double chamber right ventricle around the topic of it. So tricuspid valve here, pulmonary valve here, and there's you've got increased velocities flood before you get into the pulmonary valve to through your RVOT in this view, you can see that there's all this turbulent flow on the ventricular side of your pulmonary valve, which there shouldn't be. You know, we should have a nice wide um, outflow track for our right ventricle. And instead, what we've got uh, out of sector is we've got this uh, corrugated wall that forms within the RV and it increased flows within the right ventricle before you even get to the pulmonary valve, double chambered right ventricle. Uh, all right, so I had a few slides about an ASD, so I'm going to skip through them because Emma spoke about that quite a bit last week. Um, quick work, you know, we looked at this, looked at the anatomy of them, where they can be. It can be a secundum, um, it can be a primum, which you know, considering with a partial AVSD or atrioventricular septal defect, that should be AVSD, the misspelling there. It can be a coronary sinus defect or a superior or inferior venous sinus defect. Um, get past that. But I think this is important. And again, we want to think about, we see the sequelae of congenital heart disease, be it repaired or unrepaired. And this is what happens over time. You ASD, you get right heart enlargement, you increase pulmonary flow, but it's a volume load, and they don't often generate pulmonary hypertension. Your VSD, left heart enlargement, um, increased pulmonary flow, it's pressure load, and they get a, a much higher instance of pulmonary hypertension if it's severe enough. Anything beyond small. Um, moving on, next pathology, anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. I've included this in here within this presentation because it often links in with ASDs. Um, it can be partial or total, and it's fatal if it's total and there's no right to left shunt. So I think with some of the congenital diseases, we throw around the names of them, but sometimes for, you lose the ability to remember exactly what they are and in their detail. So what I've got throughout this next bit is just some pictures to help explain blood flow. So uh, partial anomalous pulmonary venous drainage is when your pulmonary veins uh, drain into your systemic veins back into the right atrium. So blood effectively flows on a circuit. Your right heart just keeps circuiting through. And if you don't have a, a flow from your, um, you don't have a way for blood to get across your right to left shunting, then they'll die. So, um, so normal anatomy, oh, I don't have a normal anatomy here. And then your total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. So blood flows in right atrium, right ventricle, out the pulmonary trunk, off to the lungs, uh, and those drains back in uh, to the right atrium or similar. It can drain extra in an extra cardiac manifestation. It can drain back in the paddock portal venous system. So if you don't have a way for blood to mix, um, they'll die. Most common is the right upper pulmonary vein draining to the, the SBC. Um, so they have what's called an accessory vein or a vertical vein, and this is what allows blood flow to keep happening. So your oxygenated blood flows from the pulmonary veins uh, up this vertical vein or accessory vein, mixes in with blood from the SVC back into the right atrium, and then your ASD that lets blood, some oxygenated blood, cross into your uh, other circulation and, and off it goes. So it's a total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage or partial, goes with ASDs. Because if you don't have an ASD, you'd be dead. If you don't have an ASD, you'd be dead. Um, so I've included this slide a couple of times because, again, it's just a, a driving home point. Um, yeah, your RVOT, VTI, if that's bigger than your LVOT, VTI, as Emma said before, and I'm sure you have another lectures as well, yeah, I've got a shunt until proven otherwise. Um, if you've got a left to right shunt, which you get with an ASD and, and partial almost pulmonary venous drainage or circulation, uh, right heart enlarges. Um, BSD, 
to P or PDA, your left heart enlarges. Uh, and sometimes people have pulmonary hypertension and you won't see it. So uh, do you remember Nish? He was a cardiac, uh, Nish, yeah. cardiac MRI guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So he, From, um, Mauritius. Mauritius. Yeah. Um, so he taught me, and uh, it's so nice to remember that if the shunt is above your tricuspid valve, then it's your right heart that will dilate first. If it's below your tricuspid valve, the left heart dilates first. So your tricuspid valve is your cut point above and below, uh, right and left. If you've got disease that's bad enough for long enough, everything dilates, of course, and then you die. But until that point, simple things to remember. Um, all right, so hyperplastic left heart. So this is relatively common as well, and it's a syndrome uh, rather than a specific etiology. One of the things about fetal circulation, which is different to adult circulation, is that if a chamber or a vessel, sorry, a chamber or a valve does not have sufficient flow through it, during fetal development, then it doesn't develop. So if you've got a mitral valve pathology as a fetus or an aortic valve pathology as a fetus, then you develop hyperplastic left heart because it's that bit of extra resistance stops enough blood flowing through it that the chambers just don't develop. They need flow and pressure for everything to grow and develop the correct way. So valvular lesions as a fetus, if they are stenotic lesions, will lead to chamber underdevelopment. Make sense? You need enough water pumping through that hose for the hose to stretch out, really. Okay. And that flow and effects for the aorta as well. So you can get um, stenotic aortas and that sort of thing. Uh, if you've got a hyperplastic left heart, it means that just by definition, your left heart is not big enough, not strong enough to allow survival uh, in the real world. Breathing oxygen, left heart being systemic circulation. Um, so you need some way for blood to flow across until you get surgically repaired. So one of the things about a hypoplastic left heart um, is that it becomes a bit self-preserving uh, for a very short period of time until the newborn child gets surgery or dies. So they they have a pathology with their mitral aortic valve, which is why their left heart's not strong often. That leads to raised left atrial pressures. With me so far, mitral valve stenotic. Um, those raised left atrial pressures transmit as raised pulmonary pressures. And those raised pulmonary pressures mean that um, your flow will be different across your patent ductus arteriosus. So you'll have more blood flowing from right to left through it. So you can preserve a bit more systemic circulation that way. Yeah? Yep. Why? Well, do you believe it? It just sounds amazing. All the, you know, all the PDAs amazing. that we're looking at go the other way. Yeah. I know. Um, it's incredible, right? And so this promotes blood flow back to the systemic circulation because that's what you want to do until you get surgically repaired. You need to have blood going systemically because these babies do not have that. Um, and so, you know, we talk about surgical repairs of a hypoplastic left heart. Um, you have to maintain your systemic supply, your arterial supply. Um, you have to offload the RV preserve your RV at the same time, and then optimize your circulation. This is certainly not talk about how they repair it, um, but this just goes through it step by step. So they're born like this, um, they have a PDA, their aorta is tiny because they don't have much blood flow through their left heart the whole time, their mitral valve is a bit dysfunctional, um, and then they get their Norwood where they get your atrial septostomy, so they make the hole bigger, make the aorta bigger, help blood flow from the right to the left, what we're doing through here so preserve your rv for future life and then you replumb everything as best you can baffles and that sort of thing so here's the pathology um and there's different kinds of repairs we talk about a blood lactic shunt at times just a connection from arterial to venous circulations to um help flow uh, the echo pictures are where it's at these should all loop. All right, Michael, do you want to talk through these for me? Just tell me what you see. Uh, it's a series of parasternal long axis views. Obviously, yeah. the right heart is very big. The left heart systolic function looks pretty terrible. It's hard to see the aortic valve perfectly, but it does have reduced excursion, I think. Yeah. And there's like a big, um, there's a big acoustic shadow sort of preventing me to see the rest. There's some color. <laughs> Where's the color box? The color box is over sort of the the outflow tract. Uh, it's obviously in a position that makes me think that there's some sort of VSD. 
<laughs> there's like this tiny little frame at the very end where I think that maybe as it changes a little bit of the axis, you can see some color. But I can't, to be honest, look, honest. Look at I the top right one. What's what's happening on the top right? What is happening on the top right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what what do you think is giving that acoustic shadow? An artificial structure. Yes. Yes. Uh, which is probably some sort of patch or repair or something. Yeah, that's nice. Done. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, I got there. <laughs> yeah, see, and Fine. it's really bright, necogenic, and thin, with a yeah, little bit of yeah. shadow and that artifact coming off it. Yeah. And there's no massive shunt across it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And he just that's why had, it was so hard to see the color. And he and he just did a slide on Tetralogy of Fallow just before he showed. This. Yeah. All right. Same case. Same patient. Uh, What do you think of the RV? I mean, the RV is enormous and doesn't seem to be. Have, I mean, the annulus is moving OK, but the free wall doesn't move very much. The right atrium is enormous. It yeah. looks like there's quite a lot of TR. How do you know it's moderate. the right ventricle? Because it's a repaired to trilogy of fallow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else can tell you if right ventricle is a right ventricle? Uh, well, it depends where it's pumping to. And I just want to see what the right, what the atria that's attached to it is attached to. Is that attached to the what IVC? The what the valve that's, is. Yeah, okay. Tricuspid yeah. valve means it's the right ventricle. Okay. I was also going to go the moderator band. Yeah, which you can sort of see in the last one. And if you've got an apical four chamber view, the tricuspid annulus is a is about you know under seven millimeters above the um, but it's a dis it's more apically placed than it's the mitral valve. Well. Yeah. All right. So same patient, and what do you see here? Okay. So it's a zoomed in uh, parasternal short axis view. Yeah. Nice. Again, it shows the repair. I I assume there's a large acoustic shadow behind that echo dense structure. Yeah. Um, and then the color Doppler shows. <laughs> uh, strange flow through the pulmonary outflow tract, and there's a little bit of flow as well. It looks like maybe there's some just probably turbulent flow in the aortic valve. That yeah, flow you know, is. You know that. You know what you see in the aortic. What else do you see in the pulmonary valve? Like you've described it well there. What explains that flow? That color pattern. Oh, uh, I don't know. I think um, it looks like. I mean, obviously there's some regurgitation happening. How much? It's just like, it just looks oh, quite strange. Be, how would you grade the regurgitation? Like it's there. We've got a. So I'm not sure whether you can see the pulse wave gate on the image below, but the yeah. pulse wave gate itself is situated like right at the pulmonary valve. It's well placed. Mm. Um, so how would you grade this? I love this in the ASG exams. Okay. How would I grade the severity? I mean, I'd want to see a continuous wave through it, but from what I can see of that pulse wave. It it's actually doesn't look like there's a massive amount of yeah. flow. Why would that Sorry. be? Uh, would either because the regurgitation itself is really mild, right? Like you've either got mm. no flow because the regurgitation is mild, or... Or we're not in the right spot. Or, yeah, nice. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like it, It's strange that it looks like it's so much flow on, on the colour Doppler, but that might all just be alias flow. Or going in a different direction, I'm not sort of getting it. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm perpendicular to it or something. I don't know. Sorry, I'm I'm not sure. What if you had a pulmonary valve that was just flailing? Oh, so this is someone who's had a. So they've just got they've just got no pulmonary valve because they've had a tetralogy repair. So it's like a wide open thing. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's a large opening. So the flow across it is not at high velocity, maybe. Or you get rapid equalization of pressures as you flow mm. as it flows right J okay. just the same as something like i, I don't know uh flailed like severe tr horrific what if yeah TR, severe right? TR. same thing mr all that stuff. or severe ar where you get yeah. that just that cutoff sign remember so that's mm. where it just you don't have that classic uh sort of up across and down it just goes up because mm. mm. you get rapid equalization of pressures yeah okay i see yeah, yeah it's the classic uh complication of a repaired TOF is they get, you know, 
horrific PR over time, right? Um, it's one you, of the complications you'll see. And if you look where the sort of the equalization of pressure happens, you know, you get back down to zero, somewhere about there, which is before the end of diastole. Yeah. So you've got early, you know, you've got early time when the flows get to zero, and that's the early equalization of pressures. Yeah. So torrential PR. PR. So it would look the same on continuous wave or pulse wave Doppler. And again, another thing, and I think this is going back to the physics of Doppler and pulse wave Doppler and what we're looking at, like if we're talking about this, this our, this our VTI, right, representing the blood flow across that valve in systole, if you were to plot the same parameter, but for your regurgitant flow, it would be the same. Like this is your volume of blood flowing forward in systole here, and you'd have the same volume of blood flowing back, which is my eyeballing it. This is going to have about the same area as that, because um, the blood is shuffling forward, then coming back, forward and back. And it's very easy to miss on colour because the colour is so brief. You know, it's not that long, drawn out flame um, that you would always expect to see. Easy one to miss. Uh, again, same patient. So this is our uh, short axis views, huge RV, as you would expect to see. Michael. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's a big. Um, I don't know if it's the same patient, but again, they've got a very large uh, yeah, right patient. ventricle. They've got a, a structure in that right ventricle that is thin and echo dense, and I think it's probably potentially a pacing wire. It could be some other structure. It could be a line, a PA catheter in a weird spot. Um, there's some associated tricuspid regurg, which looks pretty bad, like you'd want to be trying to check the hepatic veins, but it looks like it's probably severe, but if not, it's moderate. And then there's a colour Doppler over the other side <laughs> on the right. That colour Doppler is it's demonstrating some turbulent flow near sort of the septal knuckle into the aortic outflow tract. I can't tell if it is communicating between the, the left and the right ventricle, but it might just be turbulent flow out of the LVOT, um, I want to yeah. see it in some other views. What else would be? What could be a VST. Yeah, could be looking around that. Abnormal flow. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned hepatic vessels. Sure. Yeah. Happy to you. Here you go. Yeah. There's um there's obvious S wave reversal in the hepatic vein, so it's severe TR. And did you color match that as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean. I don't know if I'm just like, a, I, I always have to sort of pause and drag through and look at where the color is on the on the actual QRS, but it does look like, it does look like with every, digitally there's there's red backwards flow in the hepatic veins. Yeah, I, mean, I slow it down as well, like in, in real life, of course, I think as most of us probably would, or you probably don't, yeah. if you've seen this, you're, you're such a If it's but, normal flow, you so it's just a, it's just a brief wisp of where red. you get the atrial kick, right? Yeah. And this mm. way you can see you's, you can really see the red, Strong. which means that, that yeah, it's it's systolic. It's not just a little atrial kick puff. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, what you described before, and this is it sort of represented just from a, a sample education slide. Repair to trilogy fellow gets horrific PR, so um, they get this nice sort of, as Sam said. The pressure gets down to zero, it gets down to equal before you even start your next cycle, as opposed to your mild, where you, you're maintaining a little bit of persistent regurgitant flow to get your right ventricular systole coming in. Um, Coarct, I mean, I found this website, I got the link to it on the very last slide, uh, which is incredible, and it's where I stole half my images from, and it described Coarct as the eighth most common, eighth most common congenital heart disease, often associated with a bicuspid aortic valve. You can have different kinds of it, um, and it's typically where your ductus arteriosus, like the site of coarct, the of narrowing, is where your ductus joins into your aorta. That's classically the site where it occurs. Um, but let's get to the pictures. Uh, hang on. Can I escape this to make them loop? Can I do that in that one? Can I press escape? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll stop there we go all right so hey one back to you you want to tell me what you see um so it's a mid-esophageal five chamber view mm -hmm. um 
think uh, ventricular function appears preserved, um, but I think there is LV hypertrophy. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are the salient findings that I can see. Yeah, nice, fine. Not everything's a pathology. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, a two-chamber view. Yeah. Um, again, like LV hypertrophy there. Um, uh, Maybe it's a bit hard to see. It's pretty wide. It's yeah. Bit gained. They're not my pictures. I shouldn't criticize that. They're certainly quite good pictures, especially the ones near the end. Uh, they're far better than what I would get. Um, so, and you're not quite looking through the gun barrel at that ventricle. You can see how the apex and that two chamber is really sort of coming up. So commenting on wall thickness can be a bit challenging. Sure. Um, the picture to the right of the screen, what do you see? What yeah, do you think? Um, again, it's um, like a long axis across the aortic valve. Um, like aortic valve appears thickened. Um, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yep. And do you think the cusps are moving well? We're just catching it at no, a funny angle. Yeah, no, I think uh, movement appears restricted. Okay. Did you ask what that is? Like what it is? I didn't ask what that is. Can you see my cursor? Uh, no, because no, sorry, could you just do that again? I thought I could see it. No. Uh, so oh, there's yeah. a structure here, and there's a structure here. Sorry, Ben, I, I couldn't see that. The left, the left, yeah. Opposite the left, left atrial appendage, appendage. So on the left side of the screen, just above the atrioventricular groove, there's a large spherical Round thing. free space. What was that? It's like, is that coronary? No, that's not coronary sinus. Yeah, I yeah. it is. Oh, is it? I think so. Okay. It looks like it's got like a valve associated with it. Can you see a little linear there's structure in there? Tiny, thin linear structure yeah. going through here. Yeah. So what would cause that? I don't know if it's going to be relevant to this case. <laughs> what we call that? Is that a like? Is that like an? Is it like an artifice? Is that like itrogenic and there's like a wire in there or? No, no. Like a pacemaker. I, mean, I think it's a valve. I think it's the coronary sinus. But what would give you a big dilated coronary sinus? Like um, I know uh, anomalous, like persistent nice. left-sided yeah. SVC can give yeah. you that. Um, but big other than that, right I'm not atrial sure. pressures, big big right atrial pressures could as well. Come up it up, yeah. Sure. Nice. Anatomy questions on toes. Beautiful cases. All right, what do you see here? So it's a short axis across the aortic valve. Yeah, um, nice. Like it, it's by leaflet aortic valve with um, uh, like, like calcification at the um, or oh, at the um, uh, well at the uh, I forget the name of that part of the leaflet. Um, yeah, cusp, I say yeah, cusp. cusp edge. Cusp edge, okay, yeah. yeah tips of the leaflets. I say I think I'm not sure about cusp. I certainly say thickened. Sure um, thickened, yeah. Uh, and what do you think of the intake receptum? Um, like it, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's going to the left. No, that's going to the right. Yeah, hang on a minute. Uh, can we do another anatomy bit? Yeah, on this what's, the, what's the little floppy thing up at the top of the right atrium? Yeah, yeah. What's that? Well, that's yeah. in the right atrium. Yeah. That little bit just there, if you can Flicking see. Flicking in and out. Oh, that's the um, crystal terminalis. Yeah, I was going to use station ridge. I was going to go for, I guess, not for crystal terminalis. Yep. Sure. Okay, station ridge. Okay. Yeah. And what do you think of the aortic valve function? Um, so I think there's significant turbulent flow. Um, and also some regurgitation as well. So I think it does mixed stenosis and regurgitation. Mm -hmm. And so here we go. We want the next one, in the interest of time. So this is what I mean by when I said that uh, I'm not going to criticize these pictures because whoever took them is quite skilled. Um, Beautiful 3D, just like you said, it's by cusp aortic valve. Uh, and then this. Got to be for us, this one. No. 
Uh, what do you see here? So that must be what collocation looks like on a toe. Yeah, nice. Exactly right. So you can see it very briefly uh, when we're looking at the order in short axis. Put on there. Yeah. Stop playing again. There we go. Um, you can see it just flashes for a second, almost like yeah. it's narrowing and whatnot. But then when you look at the look at it in long axis, um, yeah. you can see where that narrowing branch point comes in and it winds out again. So this is yeah. a, a co-op in conjunction with Bacustro Valve. Valve. Um, they're common bed partners. Cool pictures, eh? Yeah, very amazing, right? Um, all right, I've got just a few last weird and wonderful pathologies. I'm uh, mindful of time. Um, so Epstein's, I deliberately included this in this talk because I've heard of people, namely myself, that had to deal with an Epstein's case in a DDU viva in the past. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, your tricuspid valve is just placed towards... Have to take it out of this year. Is, uh, is displaced towards your uh, apex. Now there are different stages and kinds of your uh, of Epstein's depending on where the valve, how far towards the apex it's located and some other things. Um, the right ventricular free wall, the right ventricular wall becomes what they call arterialized. There's normally more than one pathology when you see an Epstein's. Uh, and as you would expect really, like they can, they're quite prone to rhythm disturbances because their right atrium can get really big. Um, so here's the, the types of it. I mean, the types is irrelevant. The, the key point is this is what an Epstein's looks like. Your uh, tricuspid valve is really low set. And what it looks like is otherwise this. So it's just profoundly low set. And you've got massive RV, it's dilated. Um, and this is our tricuspid valve here. So you can measure this distance from the crux up to where the insertion point, the tricuspid valve is. And normally, is, Six millimeters, seven, seven, seven. Like they should be mitral tricuspid valve should be about that close offset from each other. Um, beyond that's pathological. Um, a quick word on transposition. So transposition of the great vessels. Um, there are two forms of this. There's the congenitally corrected or levo, and then there's the D dextro uh, TGA. So the dextro, the D one, is your parallel circulations. So. This is when your right blood, your pulmonary blood just flows, right heart, lungs, right heart, lungs. Your left is just systemic, systemic. And if there's no mixing, then they die. Uh, so what happens is your aorta comes out of your morphologic right ventricle. So morphologic right ventricle attached to your tricuspid valve and pulmonary trunk and left ventricle. So what we do now typically is do an arterial switch and we just switch over the aorta and pulmonary trunk. Have to relocate the coronary artery for that as well. Um, and so this is what it looks like. Oh, sorry, uh, these days are here. Uh, slides labeled wrong, this one. So this is uh, fetal study. So left ventricle, pulmonary artery, right ventricle, aorta, pediatric study, I should say. So obviously, I went looking for an adult scan of this, but there is such a thing as an adult scan of this unrepaired because those would be dead. Um, so pediatric is the best I can give you. We did a great study, sorry, just to mm. plug for the website again. Mm. Emma and I did a great study where we imaged a guy who's he's 40, but he's got baffles in place, so he's got quite similar but anatomy. Anatomy. But he's got baffles in place. So that's, Emma, on the Emma did, that's on the Echo on our, on our Echo on our Nepean website. He's a really cool guy, and he let us do a video of us that's awesome. trying to scan him. So I made Emma do it, just like I'm making you do this. Of course. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, so this is what they do. So I found these videos through the Mayo Clinic. It's like a 30-second clip. It's actually what they do um, to repair. So this is the arterial switch. An old operation used to be the atrial switch, which is a lot more complex, and that's when they would need baffles and whatnot, right? right? That's when they would have to try and switch around blood flow from the back. But when we got, when we, I say we, as though it's like it's the real we, it's certainly not me. Um, when people learn how to do amazing surgery on coronary arteries and could safely relocate the coronary arteries, that's when the arterial switch procedure um, came around. There's a modified procedure called the Rastelli, and this is where it comes in to be really important that you know what the repair has had, if you can find out. Because Rastelli is repairing a similar problem, it's the transposition with the BSD, but the repair is profoundly different. Um, you know, with the way they buffle and shunt thunk, baffle and shunt lungs in is like that, you know, clearly very different, right? Same underlying pathology, ASD versus BSD, different procedure. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Um, and this is it when it's been repaired. So 
The issue with the TGA that's been repaired is that your morphologic right ventricle is now your systemic ventricle. And so given enough time, your RV adapts to the pressure load and then it no longer adapts to the load uh, and you get a failing RV, uh, which is obviously what we're seeing here. Um, so they can get coronary artery problems, and especially in the immediate post-op period when they're you know, tiny. Uh, but that can progress even when they're older. They can get baffle obstruction if you've got a procedure that had the baffles done, like a atrial switch. And then the complications of a systemic right ventricle. So I thought this was really cool. This is a, um, a Sydney CT, actually. So this is a person that has a completely obstructed superior baffle, and they've developed at least collateral flow around from the baffle through, through, through the coronary circulation, I think, uh, and flows into the inferior baffle. So that's all that. And this one is a cardiac MR um, of a repaired arterial switch, and they've got a complete occlusion of the left coronary. There's just no flow through it. So these are the complications that we will see, right? You know, dealing with repaired congenital heart disease, we're going to see things like this and things like this. Um, they can present funny, uh, and they've got complex anatomy. So a left TGA or a lever TGA is the congenitally corrected. Um, so it is just like a repaired TGA. Uh, I'll skip this. There's a pathology called interrupted aortic arch, which in itself is amazing. Um, the aorta just stops. Uh, and my last slide, I think, is this one. So this is the website that I use to get all these pictures. It's an amazing mm -hmm. reference. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, all free. So it's not, uh, you know, bearing in mind this is a DDU talk and I've tried to have a little bit of clinical stuff. I think having a clear understanding of what some of the pathologies is, is the first point, right? And so this is an amazing website. You can click through all of these things to hear all links and they bring up the pathologies associated with them in the next menu down, go through all the repairs um, and everything. It's incredible. Um, so I strongly recommend it. And with that, I will throw open the floor to questions if there's anything. Very nice, Ben. Stop sharing. Whirlwind view oh, of congenital heart disease. That was amazing. It's huge. Um, from the DDU mm. perspective, um, and from exam perspective, uh, you're expected to know uh, about ASDs, VSDs, understand some of the anatomy that Ben's been through. You are not expected to be an expert. I don't think any intensive care specialist is expected to be perfect at these. I think for me, the important thing is Ben was talking about is trying to get the uh, trying to get the situs first and trying to figure out what the anatomy is, where the blood flow is going around those structures and trying to have an understanding of what the anatomy is. And just if I can make a couple of plugs mm. is that we do not manage these alone. It is a team game and That's early right. communication with experts in this is really important. So for us in Sydney, you know, it's uh, uh, it's normally places like Westmead RPA, where they've got those, uh, the paediatric surgeons have been working are the, are the big areas for us. Um, so yeah, early communication with centres that specialise in this. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there are many centres that specialise in adult congenital heart disease because what, what a lot of we're seeing is people who've been lost to follow up. Yeah. And that that's where we can see a lot of people with horrible abnormalities. The last thing I was going to say is when patients come in, if they've been lost to follow up, they don't have normal observations at times. So yeah, if they've nice. got severe nice. pulmonary yeah. hypertension, they're often used to having saturations maybe in the 70s. And so trying, you know, having an idea of what's normal for the patient is again important. And so it is. And, and the, I guess the patients often know that. So and they, they always know it really. Yeah. I did some of my training at Prince Charles Hospital in Brisbane for a few years actually. Um, basic and advanced training and I'd, I'd exercise tests and severe heart failure patients, occasionally some congenital patients, and their resting sats are in the 80s, and that's just them, and that's their comfort level. Mm. Um, and so you're aiming for different numbers, yeah. heart rate, blood pressure, everything. Even where, again, depending on where their anatomy is, where the ECG leads go, because things look <laughs> abnormal about that, right? Like if they've got midline or, or right-sided heart or they've got dextrocardia rather than levo, again, an ECG can look profoundly abnormal simply because the leads are not put in the correct orientation to their anatomy. Um, I think for the ASC exam, more in-depth stuff is wanted for the, for the cardiac side of things. Um, but again, you're not expected to know it at the level of a congenital cardiology specialist, uh, of course. So just having an idea of some of the anatomy and just thanks again, Ben, for going through that so, so beautifully. Um, any questions for Ben? This might be a stupid question. When you have a 
you're talking about having if you have a defect below the tricuspid valve in in a heart then yeah. why does the left ventricle dilate i was just trying, trying to think about like what causes that dilate it must give volume, a volume overload of the left ventricle but if you've got mostly a left to right shunt through a vsd or something what, why does the lv dilate so my understanding is it's due to the flow it's just that it's the volume like as you said it's the volume with so much flow circulating through it so when you're uh, shunting left, let's say you've got a BSD, you're shunting left to right, then what you're doing is like that flow is, you have a greater flow through your right ventricular outflow tract, through your lungs, back in through your LV, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just that constant larger flow. And the way that uh, it was explained to me, it was that when you have, say, your flow approach with BSD, like that flow is coming out with a lot of force, like your, mm -hmm. your left ventricle is contracting against that blood, it's pushing some of the aorta, it's pushing some of that blood out the VSD into the right ventricle, but because it's your left ventricle generating the pressure to get that blood out through the VSD, therefore, and then the pulmonary circulation, like the pressure is driven by your left heart, so it's your left heart that over time dilates out, because mm -hmm. it's the one that's generating the flow. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like your left ventricle yeah. has got to do all the work nice for that blood. Yeah, okay. And Sam, in the DDU, am, are you able to like, can as a candidate, can you can you pause the video and like scroll through to look it's, at where it's, it's on a PowerPoint similar to this. So just the same as Ben was doing there, I'm grabbing the, the thing and scrolling backwards and forwards. You do the same. Oh, easy. OK, sweet. Yeah. yeah. And That's the examiner will help you out for the, the so that you the there's time for if there's uh, problems with the AV side of things. It's it's normally pretty straightforward and you know, don't don't freak out about what you have to from that AV side of things. It's normally pretty rock solid. A couple of people, it, you know, we have seen some troubles and if there are, we'll deal with it on the day and it's taken into account. OK, but most yeah. people, you know, it's it, it should. The AV side of things is not tricky and there's often not a lot of times you've got to stop and scroll through it, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, it's okay. it's more bigger picture than that, I'll be honest, and it's not as subtle as trying to make you do it. We try and avoid having the cannons having to try and interact too much with the screen, but you can if you'd like to. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. exactly right. You rarely do. The pathology's yeah. there or it's normal. Yeah. It's next, next, next. And more of what we're doing is, is, you know, is, is trying to, there's a lot of discussion in terms, and we'll do this over the next few weeks. I think we're going to start launching into Viva sessions fairly soon. Um, it, it's, you know, to be honest, the pass-fail stuff is not, if you're stopping and scrolling through it, you're probably dealing with the minutiae a little bit. The pass fail stuff is, you know, making sure that you know how to recognize a severe valvular abnormality, how you could describe that. Uh, some little pearls and pitfalls if you've got low flow, you know, severe aortic stenosis, recognizing that, um, you know, and there'll be a few little pearls and pitfalls in there. But it, it's it's normally bigger stuff than having to figure out timings in and the times in timings in an echo loop. OK, OK, sure. Thank you. Mm. I think it was probably timings would be showing you Doppler. That's what we'd expect you to pick up. So on yeah. Doppler, be able mm. to pick up timings like that severe PR case. It'd be a lovely, mm. lovely one. You know, or there's, uh, you know, severe MR where you've got a really like low flow, uh, low flow, but yeah. highly uh, yeah. uh, shaded in continuous wave, things like that. Mm. OK, cool. Thanks, guys. Ben, legend. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. See you next thank week. You. Bye. Thank you very much.